Our way of life doesn't need to be saved. The planet needs to be saved from our way of life. Right now, civilization is causing the extinction of 200 species a day. It is drawing down the Earth's capacity to support life. I mean, ultimately, we're talking about the future of all generations being sacrificed. And Deep Green Resistance is the movement that is dedicated to stopping this. We're some of the people who are willing to be honest about what's going on here and dedicate our lives to, to stopping this culture of empire. DGR keeps the natural world at the center of all our strategies and tactics. We're working not just to stop one bad law or one bad corporation or one bad government. We're working to fundamentally transform this entire culture. There is nothing more important in this entire world than the help of the world. And the only thing that will save this planet is for industrial civilization to stop. Whatever you love, it is under assault. But love is a verb. We've got to let our love call us to action. Hello, everyone and welcome to the special live streaming event, Collapse, Ecology, Climate, and Civilization. My name is Max Wilbert, and I'm the organizing director for Deep Green Resistance. I'm the co-author of the book, Bright Green Lives, with Derek Jensen and Lear Keith, and the co-founder of Protect Thacker Pass, and I will be your host for today's event. We all know why we are here. We are in a state of ecological overshoot and ecological collapse. Whether you're talking about the world's forests, where 70 countries no longer have a single tree remaining of their ancient forests, or the oceans, where we've seen a 70% crash in phytoplankton populations, the spread of more than 530 oceanic dead zones created by industrial fertilizers and agriculture, or freshwater, where migratory fish populations have collapsed by at least 76% in the last 50 years. Or we can look at the global climate, where CO2 levels exceeded 422 parts per million this year. And climate models suggest that average temperatures on this planet could increase up to 11 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100. <clears throat> we all know why we are here. Our crisis is accelerating. Four days ago, the world population hit 8 billion people. Two years ago, the mass of all the human-made objects in the world, plastic, cars, buildings, roads, factories, and so on, the mass of all that stuff surpassed the mass of all living things, trees, grass, animals, bacteria, every single living being on earth. And by 2040, these inanimate creations are expected to have a mass more than double that of all life on the planet. More than half of all the plastic ever made, 5 billion metric tons, has been made in the last 12 years alone. That's about twice as much as the weight of all animal life on the planet, including humans, in the last 12 years. So obviously we're in a crisis. We don't need to repeat this all for you. And if you're here, it's because you are not content to sit back and watch the world burn. The real question is, 
how do we respond to this vast crisis? This crisis that threatens not just you know, a single government or nation or community, but all life on this planet. So our speakers today are going to help us answer that question. We're going to hear from activists, writers, and thinkers from all around the world. What they have in common is a dedication to taking action, and that requires community support. Our organization, Deep Green Resistance, is a small group that doesn't receive any corporate or foundation funding. <clears throat> Our work is made possible by donations from everyday people, which is why tonight's event is also a fundraiser. We're aiming to raise at least $25,000 or more to support land defense campaigns, activist training programs, educational work, and so on. And that money will allow us to continue this work. We don't pay for fancy fundraising events. This was put together on a budget of basically $0. We don't pay for lobbyists in the Capitol. We don't have a fancy headquarters building. We don't have a fleet of vehicles or a warehouse of supplies. But what we do have is a small and dedicated team of people who are really pouring their hearts into saving the planet. And that's why this event is a fundraiser and you can support by donating. If you're watching this on Facebook right now, or on YouTube after the fact, we're gonna upload this and make sure it's available for people who couldn't be here live during this event right now. Check out the link in the comments to givebutter.com slash collapse. That's give butter, butter as in the food, B-U-T-T-E-R, givebutter.com slash collapse. You can watch the live stream there. You can continue watching without being interrupted, but you can also donate on that page and see the other donations coming in uh, from people around the world. Uh, we have quite a few donations already coming in. In fact, I can share my screen here right now and let you all see for a moment some of the donations that are coming in. Uh, we're, it's very humbling to have this support from everyone who's watching. So uh, uh, thank you very much. It, it really means a lot to us. You can also sign up on this Give Butter site for recurring donations, so monthly gifts. And that really helps because that just allows us to have a predictable um, stream. So this event's a fundraiser, but I don't want to focus too much on the money because more importantly, this is about the issues, which is why uh, I'm very honored to introduce our first speaker, Lier Keith. Lier is the author of seven books. She's a radical feminist, a food activist, and an environmentalist. Her book, the Vegetarian Myth, Food, Justice, and Sustainability has been called the most important ecological book of this generation and got a very nice blurb from Alice Walker. She is also the co-author of Bright Green Lies with myself and Derek Jensen and a co-author of the book Deep Green Resistance, Strategy to Save the Planet, which is the book on which our movement is founded. So, uh, Lier, welcome and thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, I'm really happy to be here. So, okay, I have a, a short presentation that I'm gonna be offering. Let me just make sure that this is working. All looks good on my end. Yeah, I can't get this, the slide to advance. This is always a problem. Yeah, let me see if Derek can make it work. I'm hitting the arrow, but it's not moving. It's just frozen on the first slide. Do you know how to make it move? Usually if I just hit this, oh, it did, it did it. I know, magically it worked. All right, we got it. So if the whole length of that football field is our time on earth, then that last half a yard represents the length of time that we've been doing agriculture. So at half a yard is where the disaster begins. In maybe 14 different places around the world, people completely change their way of life with agriculture. In very brute terms, you take a piece of land, you clear every living thing off it, and I mean down to the bacteria, and then you plant it to human use. So it's biotic cleansing. This is Iraq, one of the places where agriculture started. Iran, Pakistan. This is what agriculture is. You pull down the forest, you rip up the prairie, 
you drain the wetland, you exsanguinate the world of water and soil and species and the process of life itself until all that is left is dust. And human society is changed to the pattern called civilization. Now that word civilization, that just means people living in cities. But what that actually means is they need more than the land can give. So food, water, energy have to come from somewhere else. And from that point forward, it doesn't matter what lovely peaceful values people hold in their hearts that society is now dependent on imperialism and genocide because no one willingly gives up their land, their water, their trees. But since the city has used up its own, it has to go out and get those from somewhere else. And that's the last 10,000 years in a few sentences. The conquest is never just physical. Civilization consumes the culture as well. So the very creation myth, for instance, of Western civilization tells men to dominate, to conquer, to go forth and multiply. No hunter gatherer is told by God to willfully overshoot the land's carrying capacity and no marginally rational person would listen to such a God. The founding myth also condemns women to sexual subjugation. Why is not a mystery. Patriarchy becomes a primary feature of civilization because its scarcity of land, of labor, of food, it drives the concept of private property. Matrifocal cultures have little investment in paternity. With private property comes inheritance and the need to establish male heirs. The valuing of paternity makes male violence inevitable. The only way a man can be sure of his offspring is through total control of a woman's body. Authoritarian technology needs an authoritarian God. So meaning was drained from the living world and placed above in an angry sky father who reigns rather than participates, punishes instead of heals. But even still, the image of the earth as a living body persisted in the West until the co-joined scientific and commercial revolutions. The new technology of domination included, well, all of this. This is essentially a list of torture implements for the living earth. The new technologies would be powered by fossil fuels and with essentially unlimited power, there would be no limits to the destruction. The only constraint left was the culture, but the concept of a living world would be finally severed on the dissection slab of mechanistic science. Francis Bacon argued that Man may be regarded as the center of the world, for the whole world works together in the service of man. Plants and animals of all kinds are made to furnish him. All things seem to be going about man's business and not their own. Nature is the base material for men's actualization and men should use her. The dominion granted by science would let men, quote, change, transmute, and fundamentally alter nature. Well, Bacon's vision is now here. Industrial technology has emptied rivers, crushed mountains, and damaged the climate itself. Its power only limited because the planet has in fact turned out to be finite. Lewis Mumford calls the result the mega machine, a seamless suite of centralized political and economic power, science and technology, whose final goal is quote, to displace life. As science writer Bob McDonald says, our technology is a superorganism that competes with the biosphere for resources and is winning that competition by taking over the surface of the planet. The critics become Cassandra's, no one is listening. Mumford saw that the culture is, quote, in the grip of an irrational compulsion. It is irrational to bleed the life out of the only planet you have, but the compulsion has an inner coherence the predictable consequence of the psychology required by the soldier rapists of patriarchy. The first rule of masculinity, wrote Andrew Dworkin, is that whatever he is, women are not. That's the psychology of othering. And once it's in place, the category female can be filled with any group that a hierarchical society needs subordinated. That need is endless when the culture is using up trees, soil, species, and slaves. 
but it's also endless when men's psychology is based on sadism. Psychiatrist Eric Fromm defines sadism as the passion to have absolute and unrestricted control over a living being. Now a personality with an endless drive to prove itself against another, any other, creates a violation imperative. The sadist is never satiated. There is always another wild being or self-willed creature, not in the service of man, who must be broken and brought to heal. Male supremacy eroticizes domination and subordination, inscribing synapses of sadism into the brain. Anything tied to sexual response will feel not just natural, but primal. Arousal lights up the limbic system, a part of the brain so ancient it's found in all vertebrates. Every area of the brain involved in sex is activated maximally. There is no stronger endogenous stimuli. That process has been hijacked, not just by patriarchy, but specifically by the pornography industry. The scale of the takeover is nearly inconceivable. Across the culture, this vicious industry is rewriting our collective sexual script by, in the words of neuroscientist David Norman Doge, fusing sex with hatred and humiliation. In the subordination of woman, inequality itself is sexualized, made into the experience of sexual pleasure, essential to sexual desire, wrote Andrea Dworkin. This is both the core of patriarchy and its brilliance. The brilliance of feminism is that we figured that out. Women took the tools of political, of political analysis learned on the left and applied them to our own lives, teach slaves to read, and eventually they revolt. Eventually they also write their own political theory. The worst subordination women experience is in the realm called private, done by men who claim to love us through actions they experience as sex. The numbers are a trauma all their own. Battering, for instance, in the United States, a man beats up a woman every nine seconds. One third of battering starts when a woman is pregnant and male violence, a man's willful fist or foot is the number one cause of birth defects. 80,000 American children are sexually abused every year and 80% of the time, quote, a parent is the perpetrator. You know it's not their mothers. One by one, men do this to the most vulnerable. Children are so easy to control and even easier to hurt. The small bones break, the fragile tissues tear, the fledgling self splinters from its only body. 80,000 times the world should stop spinning and it doesn't, and I don't know why. What feminists see is that the war against women and the war against the earth have not just the same driver, but the same endpoint, necrophilia. As the living world has been turned into the technosphere, so the human body is under the same assault. This is the reign of the image made supreme by social media. We no longer are our bodies and they're with their animal integrity, but wardens in a pornoptican, watching ourselves watch ourselves. To be seen is to be disciplined, but to be invisible is to die. The young especially are being destroyed by the impossibility of this experience, girls most of all. Teen porn is of course, one of the most common internet search items globally, and girls have to live in the same world, both online and off as the men who type that. And that transsexualism is now a driving narrative of disembodiment and dismemberment with the medical procedures to match. Our bodies are now things we have, things made up of other things, collections of replaceable parts. Breasts, vaginas, and penises can be bought, as can puberty, or so claim the modern day Dr. Frankensteins. In reality, the sex body, like the prairies and the forests, like the planet itself, is a living process with its own self-willed integrity. The effects of puberty blocking drugs are catastrophic. Perfectly healthy children are being turned into lifelong medical patients, permanently sterilized before their first kiss, a kiss they may never have, given that a sex drive is one main point of puberty. This is a movement arguing for the destruction of the generative organs of children. I have no word for this, but necrophilia. The essential disembodiment of the internet is the dream of the necrophiliac, 
obsessed as they are with robots and machines. There are now men who want us to upload ourselves into the internet. Tech millionaire Martine Rothblatt is one of them. He also declares himself a woman. Note that he made a robot to replicate his wife and gave it her name, Bina. This is where the Stepford Wives meets Silence of the Lambs. He also started a religion. Nanobots will replace all life. Humans will upload themselves into computers to live forever, and technology will take over the universe. Rothblatt intends to do away with biology entirely. This is narcissistic rage, driving the disordered to his predictable endpoint, necrophilia. Enraged that he can never be a woman, which he must know, beneath his dense layers of denial, he would destroy all life in revenge. And so the technosphere will end at the necrosphere. This is what feminists know. The male erotic trinity, sex, violence, and death reigns supreme. Andrea Dworkin tried to show the world what she had learned through the childhood molestation, the battering, and all the rapes. Men tell us who they are, believe them. When bison are under attack, they pack into a tight circle. Protected at the center are the mothers and babies. Next are the older calves, weaned and vulnerable. A defensive ring of cows without young comes next. And finally, facing out, stand the bulls. We are under attack. Every last creature is under threat. He has leveled mountains, believe him. If we all make that tight circle, mothers and babies of every species at the center, protected until the last, and plant our feet firmly on our still living earth, we can face him down. He has the rancid thrills of sadism and the sterile dreams of machines. We have love and the miracle of our animal bodies and the stalwart light of every dawn. Don't let him win. Thank you. Ooh, thank you very much, Lear. Your well, words are your words are very powerful and moving as always. Um, yeah, I, I uh, for those who haven't read Lear's books and essays, I highly recommend doing so. Um, she is a poet, and uh, you know, for those who <laughs> who misunderstand uh, the work of radical feminists to somehow be hating men. <laughs> I, you know, which is something that comes up every so often. I just got a message from somebody the other day who was misinterpreting your work that that way. I, I think back to our mutual friend, Gail Dines, who, you know, I was probably 20 years old when I heard her say, feminists are men's best friend because we're the people who actually don't believe that men are inherently monsters. We believe that it's a socially created system. And, uh, you know, that to me, person on a personal level has been a, 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 a tunnel to the light. It has been a, a way out of sort of the, the madness of, of masculinity that is, is an atrocity for women and girls and the living planet and that uh, leaves men's souls and, and realities in tatters as well in, in many cases. Um, so thank you very much. So uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to thank those of you who are donating. Got to turn this light off. It's kind of flickering. Thank, thanks again to those of you who are donating. We've already reached 20% uh, of our goal. If you are on the Facebook watching right now, check out the Give Butter. There's a link in the comments where you can make a donation right now. I understand we're all working class people. We don't have a lot of extra money. So if you can't donate, we completely understand. But if you can, it will go a long way to helping us do this work. So I want to introduce our second speaker this evening. This is Saba Malik. Um, before I go into her introduction, Saba has said she's prepared to take some questions from the audience. So if people want to leave questions in the Facebook comments, 
those are getting <clears throat> sent to me and I will try and uh, get through as many of those as, as we can. Um, Saba is a board member of Fertile Ground Institute. She's a mental health counselor working in the Bay Area, and she's been a feminist and anti-racist activist for most of her adult life. She's also an herbal medicine practitioner and a mother of two wonderful children. Uh, Saba has been a dear friend of mine for many years and someone I'm proud to stand alongside in the movement for justice and the movement to save the planet. And I'm very, very glad to have her with us today. So um, before you begin, Saba, I was just prompted to also point out to people that we have an auction going on simultaneously with the uh, donation page on GiveButter. So if you're watching on Facebook, the link will be in the comments to that auction, and you can go and check out some of the items that have been donated. So Saba, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Hello, Max. Hello, everyone. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, we had a, a brief chat earlier, and I was saying that I wasn't sure that very many people know who I am. So why would they want to hear me? And you said, well, I want to hear you. <laughs> so anyway, are there any, I, I, I know you sent me some questions already, but are there any other questions at this time? I'll be feeding those to you as you go, Saba. So if you want to start off with um, an introduction, like we talked about, to your background and how you got involved with that work, maybe we can dive in there. And by then, we should have some more questions from the audience that we can throw in, as well as those ones that we talked about previously. Okay. So, I mean, I was, uh, my journey is that I was first politicized through uh, radical feminism where at my in my first year at university. Uh, my my tutor and my personal tutor was a woman called Deborah Cameron, and uh, she had just published a book with Elizabeth Fraser called *The Lust to Kill*, uh, and it was the first feminist analysis of serial and sexual murder, and it had a profound effect on me, as did her class. So that was my introduction to a, a you know, the opening of political awareness. And uh, once you know you've been politicized through one issue, it's easy to then extend that to other areas. And so um, I also became involved with uh, anti-racist organizing. Uh, and it wasn't until much, much later that you know concerns about environmental, um, you know, and ecological problems really much later in the day after actually my first child, Roma, was when I really, uh, it really hit me that it th th this was uh, something that was really required my attention and understanding. And my introduction to that was through um, learning about peak oil or, and resource depletion. And so from there, I, I, I quickly saw that even though there were some what what we call you know bright green so-called bright green solutions in uh to the problems like you know green capitalism and in investing in socially aware uh, you know investments and that kind of thing i realized really quickly that that was just uh the same thing that we were doing just dressed up in a in another costume and it wasn't going to work and that uh, eventually led me to derek's work which kind of really saved me. Like I, I think that um, many people feel like this who are watching this at Derek's work saved them because it gave them an articulation for all the things that uh, that that they were feeling. And certainly that was my in my case. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Is that sufficient? Did you want more? That's great, Saba. Thank you very much. Um... So I'm going to jump in. We've got uh, a few questions coming in, but I'm going to start with one of them that we talked about beforehand, which is about your background. Your family is from Pakistan, and Pakistan is one of the hardest hit countries by global warming, the impacts that they're seeing. It's the most heavy, heavily glaciated country, one of the most heavily glaciated countries in the world. <clears throat> so all the drinking water, the irrigation for crops and so on 
all comes from these rapidly shrinking uh, glaciers in the Himalaya and the Karakoram and so on. Um, it's also a country that has seen a lot of political instability as the result of colonization, the partition, and so on. Um, would you mind talking about, you know, what what you've seen playing out in in Pakistan? Because the way you've described it to me, you see a lot of um, what's happening in places like Pakistan as a glimpse into the future of what's coming to places like the United States and other wealthier areas of the world. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the Pakistan, India, well, India is, India is also really affected, but many of those countries, many of the countries um, that we call the third world, whether they're in Africa or in Asia, are, you know, in a kind of free fall, which, and, that, and I think that it's important that people, even though it seems very far away and removed from people who live in this country, for those who are paying attention, it's important because there's some important lessons to be learned about what is coming down the line. It may not look exactly the same when it gets here, but there are definitely huge overarching things that are going to be the same. And even now at this point, I would say that politically both America and Pakistan are in you know a, a, a crisis even though it might might not feel that obvious to to many many people over here um, Pakistan at the moment uh, seems like that they're, they're, they're poised on the brink of a civil war because the last prime minister Imran Khan who was also way back in the day captain of the Pakistani cricket team, but who, after he retired, put completely dedicated his his life to social justice, and then eventually came up through the political ranks. And he, at this point, has about seventy five percent of the country are uh, in agreement with him, are behind him, support him, and he was ousted by uh, the the current prime minister Shabazz Sharif, who is from. A family who is basically a ruling family, uh, a, you could even call it a type of royalty um, in, in Pakistan, who have been robbing that country for years and years. And they, they ousted him uh, on false charges. And recently they even tried to have him killed. Of course, it's been um, called something else. But, the, but there's people out in the streets and there are hundreds and thousands uh, everywhere all over the country so we'll see what happens with that but then the other part is the devastating floods e ecologically speaking um and there's a food crisis there already you know so many people are starving i think something like over 12 million people lost their homes due to the floods uh, over 12 million acres of farmland and orchards have been devastated and they're still under many of the many millions still underwater at this point. So they don't know, you know, by the time they dry out, if there's any more rain, it's going to be impossible to plant, you know, forget this year's crop, they won't be able to plant next year's crop. And they're already, there's a, you know, food shortage there. So what's down the line there is really scary. Um, people, most people, I mean, I have, uh, I still have relatives in Pakistan in, Karachi and in Lahore and in Islamabad and all places uh, except the extremely, extremely rich are ex uh, if they have and that's if they have electrical generators are experiencing anything from eight to 18, 20 hours a day without any kind of power at all, any electricity. Um, there's rations or gases incredibly expensive people who are using kerosene to make their food that's wildly expensive all food is <coughs> i'm being told by uh my relatives who live out there is that food is prohibitively expensive and we're just starting to see that over here i mean i think i've spoken to so many people who say god did you you know in the last two years what that food prices have increased so much what I used to be able to get for, let's say, $50 now costs me near $100. Everything seems to have doubled in price. So there are signs already 
uh, in in the country for the people who are, are paying attention that you know where we we are and then there's you know also the the climate um, catastrophes that are happening the hurricanes and the strange weather too mild or it's really really rainy and uh, just now we had the the big snowstorm up up in the I think in in Boston is my cousin's coming back from there and her flight was was rerouted because uh because of the weather does that is that sufficient answer to the question yeah yeah absolutely so I'm I'm curious Saba if you could dive in a little bit to sort of the transition that you've gone through in terms of becoming aware of peak oil and resource constraints and then sort of bringing in the ecological angle to the point now where you advocate for resistance. Because, you know, one thing that I, I really find striking about you in our friendship, in our relationship, and seeing you in the world speak to people both, uh, you know, in private, just going to the grocery store or something like that, as well as in public at large events like this, um, on stages and so on is your ability to relate to anyone on these issues, you know, to bring it down to a really simple level, to get away from academic jargon and not do what a lot of radicals seem to do, which is sort of a self-isolation where they say something like, nobody believes what I believe. You know, I'm just, I'm just this lonely, isolated person who understands what's wrong with the world and everyone else is just sheep out there going along with how things are. You have this ability to just connect with people uh, at an authentic level and and allow people to open up about these issues and actually talk about them, which I find really striking. Would you mind talking a little bit about uh, <laughs> your advice to activists and regular people who are trying to stand up on these issues and find that sort of courage in themselves to speak out? Oh gosh, that that's such a huge question, Max. I can't believe you laid. <laughs> I'm trying to challenge you. <laughs> I, I, what I can say is that I think there are different stages. At, at least that there, there, there was for me on this journey. I mean, there were many years in there where I just feel think that I was so freaked out and so angry that conversa my conversations were not necessarily helpful with people who didn't see the issues or said, oh, you're overreacting or, you know, I was impatient and, uh, and self-righteous. And, and I really, and I think when I look back, I realize how that's really, it's, it's really ineffective. If, if you want to engage people, that, is, that doesn't mean that everyone does, not everyone does. But my, my life is such that I have a foot in kind of each, uh, you know, I have my political, uh, friends and then I have my friends and family uh, that many of whom now we you know co collapse and uh, ecological collapse as well as just the 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 darkness of the the nastiness of the culture that we live in have become regular conversation points I could not have imagined that let's say 10 years ago they were much more fractious um, I think that uh, people, I felt people found me, you know, oh God, she's gonna come and just like ruin everybody's evening. Uh, and I started to, I started to feel like that. Like, I don't, I don't think I wanna be that person, but I also want to be able to talk about, um, talk about these uh, subjects because I think they're important. And I, for me, what I realized is, is it, it really is about and I think this is true for anything. It's always about the tone you use. It's all. It's always about how you approach it. Are you going to approach it with humility and a, a genuine desire to engage on those subjects, or are you going to come in uh, like arrogant and and uh, already defensive and and ready to jump down somebody's throat because they can't see what is really obvious to you? Um, so I think, I mean, as far as when I first learned about peak oil <coughs> and resource depletion, uh, I think, you know, I read The Parties Over by Richard Heinberg and I had watched uh, The End of Suburbia, a number of, you know, other, other things. And I realized really quickly, one thing is, it, it's really basic to understand 
to understand peak oil in a nutshell is to understand the idea of EROI or, or net energy. So energy return on energy invested. And that can be the same as money. Like how much, if you put $5 in and you're getting $100 out, that's a pretty good deal, whatever you're investing in, right? And that's basically net, the idea of net energy. How much energy, so for, for if, if we talk about back in the, the 50s, 60s, I think maybe 70, that one barrel of oil, you needed to uh, use one barrel of oil and that would yield you a hundred barrels of oil, which in ecological terms, if anyone understands anything about ecology, in ecological terms, that's, that's almost like free energy. Like it, it's, it's mad how, how, but now the, the truth is, is that, for every barrel of oil, I think we're able to, this culture is able to extract 15 to 20 barrels. So it's dropped astronomically. What is, and, and when we use oil and petroleum products in, in, for everything, for the way that this, this way of life is based on, when that drops, you know, even more, what is life gonna look like? life is going to look very different, you know, like a, a lot of the so-called, you know, third world countries where they're having massive blackouts. And even in Europe with this uh, proxy war in Ukraine, my, I had a, a niece talking to me who lives in Hamburg. They're not using their heating because uh, they're, they're rationing how much uh, heating people can use, how much hot, how, how much hot water people can use. Um, my friends in England tell me that lots of the, the, the grocery shops over there, Tesco's and Sainsbury's, when you go there, loads of the shelves are empty and they're back to like rationing certain things. You can only have, you know, one, I don't, I think toilet roll. I don't know why it's always toilet roll. It's so bizarre to me <laughs> that people go mad about, you know, anyway, that's, yeah. uh, I think a little bit off topic but well we've we've got some great questions rolling in we're short on time so i'm just going to take one of them for now i might email them to you later maybe and you could get in touch with the people directly or we could talk about doing a follow-up video or something like that maybe oh. hop on the green flame podcast and discuss some more of these questions because i always love talking with you you know that <laughs> um but this is just a short one which is sort of a follow-up tony asks Pakistan's population today is 236 million, and the projected population in 2050 is 366 million. So that's an increase of 130 million people. Given the poverty, climate change, vanishing wildlife and nature, this spells collapse. What can be done? Tony asks. Okay, Tony. Yeah, ask the easy question. <laughs> I'm not in charge of anything over there, but what, what can be done? The thing is, you know what? It's not so much what can be done as to how you're going to respond to what actually happens. Because, I mean, we, we, can, we can all work towards, you know, making this culture collapse. And I think that that is really important work, by the way. Um, but you also have to be realistic in, in, in uh, how many people are actually going to go out there and do that. So some of these, like in Pakistan right now, like I said, they're on the brink of a civil war because of what's happened with uh, the last prime minister, Imran Khan, and the fact that he was ousted. And then two weeks ago, you know, he was nearly assassinated. And um, there, there was another assa assassination of, a, of a, a very famous journalist who was exposing government lies um, in Kenya. He had to flee the country and then they had him killed in Nairobi. But the thing is, there are so many, it's difficult to say because there are lots of uh, unknown factors, right? Things that could happen. Now, if Pakistan does plunge into a civil war, uh, the, what are the project, what I would say is what are the projections based on? Because right now there's a, there's a food crisis. So there's lots of people dying. Already lots of people died because of the floods. In the future, because so much of Pakistan's farmland and um, and so many of their orchards were destroyed in the floods, 
you know, the, the, down the line in the next few months, we're really going to find out how hard all the next year. And then if they can't plant, there's even more. So, I mean, as well as people being born, there's going to be a lot of people dying, you know? So I think that, that, that those are some, um, you know, I can't, I can't give an answer that like what can be done. There's a lot of people doing great relief work out there just for humans, but but very few, there's not a very big environmental movement in Pakistan. What would be great is if some, if people over there actually started to get into groups to, especially um, to preserve uh, the wildlife and uh, all, all wildlife, you know, plant and animal life in the, mount, in the mountainous areas, because those are some of the last untouched areas left in, in Pakistan. Most of Pakistan is desertified, as Lier pointed out in, in her excellent presentation. Um, I don't know if that really answers Tony's question. It's a hard maybe, one. Maybe we could talk about it, Tony. I don't know. That's a that's a really hard question. What can be done? Yeah. That's like yeah. asking about what can be, what can be done. What we've been what what is talked about in uh, decisive ecological warfare. That's what can be done. Yep, the DGR book. For those who haven't read it, I recommend it. Um, and we're going to get into a little bit more later in today's event when we talk with Derek. We're going to get into a discussion of some of the good and bad aspects of collapse, like the positive things like lower energy consumption, lower deforestation rates, uh, you know, a, a, a recovery of oceanic dead zones. There are very positive aspects to collapse for the natural world in many cases. Oh, absolutely. There are also all these negative aspects of, you know, people starving, um, <laughs> of social instability and breakdown, civil war, uh, conflict, uh, food crises, and so on. So we're going to talk about how do you, we're going to start a discussion of how do you assist in the positive aspects of collapse and slow down or retard or mitigate the negative aspects of collapse, which is, uh, is going to be very difficult to do. But that, it's a very important work for us to do. Foundation for that needs to be set now, yesterday. Yeah. But anyway, I know my time is up. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Saba. I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Good to, for, good to see you. Yeah. Very, very good to see everyone. Very well, insightful and well spoken, as always. For anyone who hasn't had the pleasure of meeting Saba uh, in person, I hope you're able to in the person in in the future. You're uh, very kind. I think I've <laughs> way through it, but thank you. So we're going to move on to the next segment. Um, I want to thank those of you who are donating one more time. I'll share my screen here um, to show where we're at. We have donations rolling in. We're making pretty good progress. So thank you very much to the people who are donating material support like this. It's the lifeblood of resistance movement. Uh, so, it, you know, if you can't donate, volunteer, contact us via our website, deepgreenresistance.org, sign up for our email list, uh, start organizing in your area, you know, to create a better future, we're going to need a serious, disciplined, organized political resistance to industrial civilization. And that's what we're trying to build here at Deep Green Resistance. So again, if you're watching on Facebook, you can donate at givebutter.com slash collapse. That link is in the comments. And we're also running an auction. That link is in the comments too. There's some interesting items in there. Some of Derek Jensen's books, some great art from my friend Trav, Deep Green Arts, very talented artist. Just did a beautiful mural on the side of the Pendleton building in Pendleton, Oregon. Um, or maybe it's not in Pendleton, Oregon, Trav. Maybe it's in, uh, maybe it's the Pendleton outlet up the river there on the Columbia. But um, anyway, he's a great artist. So check out the auction as well. Um, that will be running for a few more days. And this uh, uh, fundraiser will also be open. So people can donate after the fact, after the event is over. You can keep donating. So please, um, Please do what you can and thank you very much for your support.
So next, we are going to hear a series of short report backs from activists in Deep Green Resistance uh, around the world who are involved in different kind of, of work. We're also going to hear from some allies. These individuals are often taking very serious risks and making large sacrifices to make the world a better place. So it's really an honor to introduce these speakers and activists from around the world. And let's dive right into the video. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Robson, and I'm a DGR member working primarily on the Protect the Thacker Pass campaign right now with Will Falk, Max Wilbert, Travis London, and other volunteers. The Protect Thacker Pass campaign is a campaign to protect an area in northern Nevada from a lithium mine. This area of northern Nevada is still pretty wild, relatively speaking. Thacker Pass is home to over 300 species of plants and animals, including the threatened greater sage grouse who live there and mate there and need large areas of undeveloped, quiet land to do so. Thacker Pass is part of the McDermott Caldera, a Yellowstone hotspot from 16 million years ago, where large quantities of lithium precipitated from the hotspot into a lake that is now a clay caldera. Lithium Americas wants to build a massive lithium mine there that will completely destroy this wild place. Several other companies are also looking at building lithium mines in the same region. We're fighting this lithium mine as part of a broader effort to fight increasing industrialization of wild areas in the name of clean energy and clean technology. In this case, specifically so-called clean cars. Most people have no idea where lithium comes from, so we're using this project as an opportunity to help educate people about electric vehicles and what's involved in making them, and about mining lithium and mining more generally and how destructive it is to the planet. As Max, Derek, and Lierre explained in their book, Bright Green Lies, and Julia Barnes showed in her documentary of the same name, there is no such thing as clean energy. Will Falk is working with regional tribes to fight this mine using legal methods, although he fully expects to lose that fight because the law is stacked against us. However, we have been able to delay the mine through these efforts. Max Wilbert has been relentless in his work to publicize the destruction that will be caused by this mine and regularly goes to Thacker Pass to take his beautiful photos, as you've seen here in this video, and make videos to help explain why this mine and the many others like it that are planned will just help to destroy more of wild nature while keeping this ecocidal culture going just a little bit longer. Working on the campaign has been a great opportunity for me to work closely with DGR people I can learn a lot from in terms of how to organize, how to use the media, and how to raise awareness about an issue that is critically important both for us who are fighting more development as well as to those who believe in the bright green lies. I've also learned a ton about mining, about lithium specifically, and about electric vehicles. I hope you'll join us in fighting the mine and or fighting similar projects in the wild places that you care about. Thanks. Hello, I am Silas Wameo. I come from Kenya. In East Africa. I was born in western part of Kenya and uh, I grew up under the care of my late maternal, maternal grandmother actually. She was illiterate, she never went to school. So as a literate person she depended so much on nature and on the environment to actually to take care of us. We were men of us staying under the, her care. She could plant all type of trees, fruiting trees, that she could grow fruits during dry seasons. She used to plant all types of crops, all types of plants in our home. For instance, we had in our compound, we had mosquito repellent plants that used to protect us against the mosquito bites. So you realize that 
she was so passionate about nature and I started learning after her. I remember as a young boy of nine years old having escorted my grandmother to the land to plant trees and with time she started assigning me duties to plant trees and to take care of trees against uh, animal harms. So I loved nature, I loved environment, I loved protecting nature ever since I was a young boy. So along the way my grandmother passed away leaving me under the care of my my uncles. My uncles didn't like me. They chased me away one year after the departure of my grandmother. So I, after they had chased me, I used to sleep under the trees. I could sleep on the trees that we used to plant with my grandmother. So we, my grandmother had a, had a small forest in her compound. So after I had been, after I'd been chased away from my home, from my maternal grandmother home, I, I remember I used to sleep on trees, the trees that we had planted previous years with my grandmother. So when we were planting those trees, I never knew that these trees could at one time in my life be my shelter. I was adopted by another old grandmother who gave, who assigned me also the duties of taking care of her trees in her compound. She was aged, so she adopted me. And I grew up in an environment where trees was my passion, nature was my passion. So after I had completed my school, I left the village to, to, to go and look for my own means of survival. Years later, after six years, I went back at my grandmother's home and I found out that all the trees, all the forests of my grandmother had been cut down. There was nothing actually. The forests were all down. I remember crying and crying. That's when I decided, no, I'm going to take care of the nature. I want to start taking care of the nature and currently I'm moving around it the villages of Kenya, encouraging people to plant trees, protecting our soil, protecting our nature, our environment, our plants, our forests, our animals. I'm speaking out against this. I want to encourage people to plant trees to take care of our environment. And I'm requesting for your support. I, I request for your financial support to help, be able to help me to move around media station, to move around the street, mobilizing people, telling people to take care of our environment, to take care of our trees, to take care of our wildlife. That's my passion. I'm currently requesting for your support. Thank you. Hi, here is uh, the DGR team uh, from France. We are all gathered in Lyon because we have an eco-feminist event uh, starting in a few hours and we are very excited. So thank you for the fundraiser and we are very happy to show you what we have been doing the past year and so we are going to show you some videos of uh, our activists. Thank you so much, bye! Hi, my name is Theo, I am a member of DGR France and I am also a member, a peer group involved in the fight against the construction of a hillside storage reservoir in La Clusa, a well-known French ski resort located in the Alps. The principle of a hillside storage reservoir is the abstraction of fresh and drinkable water from a natural water source, which is then stored in a very large pool. The aim of this building is to supply the snowmaking machines. These machines are today the only way of offering the postcard setting and ski-in, ski-out accommodation while these people are expecting to find in our mountains. For two years, citizens and local groups had initiated civil methods such as legal challenges, awareness actions or petitions, Last year, the first tactic or peer group used to fight this construction was non-violent civil disobedience and the first step has slowed down the administrative process. But it was not enough to win this fight. Recently, we set up a zone to defend in the forest where the, the reservoir is supposed to be constructed. This zone to defend also led to a huge local and national mediatic fight. We had to work hard to make the mediatic cover an advantage for us, for sure we did it. Today, November 2022, we have won our first legal victory, stopping the threat of the construction, work to start uh, for at least one year or two. This victory is for me a great example of complementarity tactics working together towards the same goal. Also, I believe this fight has contributed to the emergence of a strong local resistance culture. The zone to defend is now dismantled and the forest back to its initial state being just a forest and not a fucking pool. 
So uh, DJR women from France were in Filia this year. It was amazing. We have seen some um, sisters from UK and we had a great time. Um, and then uh, we are here today in Lyon, France, where we are organizing a eco feminist event. And we are expecting about 30 to 40 women and men from all over France. And uh, it has been very difficult to put this event in place because we had a lot of hostility. But we are very, very happy to be part of this and to do this today. Uh, we think it's very important and DJR is very proud uh, to host this event. The Green Resistance also aims to support local struggle. And this is what we do here in Brittany with our local group. We are supporting the struggle against a factory project, the largest frozen pastry factory in the world, which will destroy 52 acres of fertile land. We have organized several mobilizations, a civil disobedience action, and helped to publicize this struggle. We are doing all this strategically The aim is to be able to extend the struggle to denounce the agro-industrial lobby which has an extremely destructive hold on Brittany in terms of air, water and soil pollution and land destruction. We are going to organize ourselves with all the other local collectives and all together put in place an efficient and serious strategy to take Brittany back from the machines. Hello everyone, uh, this is Joe of DGR Asia Pacific and I am here to show my support for this uh, very important event. So um, here in Archipelago we have tons of ecological concerns uh, such as uh, deforestation due to mining and uh, land conversa uh, conversion, uh, to quarrying, land reclamation, water pollution, air pollution, drought season, Uh, flood during natural disasters uh, like uh, typhoon and marine ecology destruction which is happening in different parts of the country. <clears throat> also at the moment I am working as a community organizer for a local NGO here uh, that focuses on the concern of uh, fisheries and aquatic resources and because of this work uh, we have the chance or the opportunity to share Uh, the perspective of deep ecology in our fisher folks uh, community. So at the moment, um, we are fighting the issue of IUUF or the illegal, uh, unreported and unregulated fishing, uh, which is one of the cause why until now, many of our municipal or small fisher men or fisher folks are still in the uh, poverty line and why our fishing ground become degraded that creates imbalance that can erode uh, the food web and lead uh, to a loss of other important marine life including uh, vulnerable species like uh, sea turtles and uh, corals that uh, will lead uh, to uh, total collapse and uh, and destruction So on my perspective, uh, IUUF is only a product of this thing uh, we call uh, industrial civilization, this, which raped, which raped uh, the natural world. And that's why it is very important that we keep sharing uh, this, this perspective uh, in our community while uh, we are promoting the importance of the uh, culture of the, uh, the culture of persistence and uh while we are working and fighting together as a as a group or as a collective or as a network or as allies so i think um uh, that is the reason why dgr was created and here and uh, that is the reason why i become part of this organization and uh, before i end this video I would like to express uh, my solidarity and my deep appreciation for all those people who are fighting for the natural world and for those people who are uh, helping us in so many different ways such as uh, sending donations which is very important uh, for the operation and work of the organization. Again, uh, thank you so much.
uh, and uh, solidarity. Hi, my name is Julia Barnes, and I'm involved in the campaign Deep Sea Defenders. This campaign got started when I learned that they are planning to extract metals and minerals from the deep ocean, and these would primarily be used by the green tech industry. Deep Sea Defenders looks at this issue from a biocentric perspective and putting the health of the ocean first. The ocean is fundamental to the survival of most life on the planet. Two out of every three breaths we take come from plankton in the ocean. And the ocean is also under threat in so many different ways from so many different industries. But deep sea mining is an issue that terrifies people who have been involved in ocean conservation for a long time because it could well be the thing that pushes the ocean over into complete collapse. It is so important that we have a strong resistance to deep sea mining. But something that I've really noticed as I've been involved in this campaign is that when you're aware of what's happening to the planet, it can be really easy to get overwhelmed because it seems like everywhere you look, there's a new destructive industry popping up. There's a new mining project being proposed. And it's like this avalanche of, of things that we have a really hard time staving off. And that is why I think that the larger cultural transformation work of Deep Green Resistance is so important. Because unless it is stopped, this culture will destroy everything. And I think the fact that they are going after the deep sea for minerals is evidence of that. They have run through everything that's easily accessible on land, and even the hardest to get at, most remote places are coming under threat, which I think tells us a lot about where we're at in ecological collapse and in this culture's overshoot. We need to be urgently opposing these new horrible mining projects that are going in, but ultimately we need to challenge things on a much larger scale. We need a serious resistance movement and there couldn't be a more important time to get involved. So I hope that people who are watching this will support the work of Deep Green Resistance and think about getting involved in one of the campaigns or, or starting one of your own. Life on the planet is at stake, so we really need all the help we can get. Okay. <clears throat> Powerful to see those videos, people around the world. That was from four continents. Uh, we need uh, Antarctica and South America. <laughs> we have a lot of allies and uh, some DGR organizers in South America, but we didn't get any video report backs from them this time around. But it's powerful to see all those voices. So, uh, you know, and I want to say to those people, 
who are doing the work on the front lines, we see you, you know, we honor you, we uplift you, uh, we support you, we're with you every step of the way, we're behind you, uh, we're alongside you. So uh, we're going to hear from one more person in our uh, re brief activist report backs here, and that's our very own Deanna Meyer. Deanna is on the board of Deep Green Resistance and is the founder and executive director of Prairie Protection Colorado, which works to protect a keystone species, the prairie dogs, along the front range of the Rocky Mountains where they meet the Great Plains. So Deanna, welcome. I'm so glad to have you with us. And uh, I'm actually drinking some of your wonderful OSHA honey in my tea right now to uh, keep my throat nice and smooth for this event. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your work and what's going on uh, along the front range of Colorado? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Am I on there? Okay, great. Yeah, so we've been really working to uh, engage activists into learning how to be um, advocates for prairie dogs by falling in love with them and protecting all of the community that they support too, which is the entire grasslands basically, especially here. And we get people to do actions to try to get them used to speaking to power and watching that when they do this, that we are able to save these small areas, not nearly big enough, we try to get everybody to recognize that we need to attack the system because that without destroying, dismantling civilization and getting more and more advocates towards that area, then everybody that we've saved is still at risk. Uh, this year, we've saved thousands of prairie dogs, both through opening up wildlife refugees to have them move to, which is unfortunate in some ways because their land is being destroyed. Um, but there is no way that we were able to stop those those developments. So we have been able to save thousands and move them onto land. And we've also used a lot of advocates to speak out, to show up at meetings, to raise holy heck against people who are thinking about poisoning prairie dogs. And we've stopped many, many of those poisonings and the prairie dogs are still in their place this year too. We're also working this year and hoping to get a bigger group with DGR people involved in a huge forest thinning campaign that's going on in the entire West. Colorado is one of the first places that they're going to hit. They have 3 million acres along the front range that they are eyeballing. So every single public forest that people care about both in Colorado and in Montana and in Oregon and in all of the West now has a huge amount of money, $5 billion going towards that to destroy these forests. So we are now just at the beginning of really trying to activate a large group of people to come together, to learn how to organize and to figure out multiple ways to resist these destructions of land. And of course, as we all know it, and thanks to everybody here that's supporting us as well, Deep Green Resistance works very hard to get to the root of these systems and to really engage people in trying to do whatever they can to protect those areas and those beings that they love. Thank you so much, Deanna. Really appreciate your work. And uh, Deanna loves, lives up in the mountains of Colorado on an absolutely beautiful piece of land that came down to her that she stewards and protects and has brought these prairie dogs to who are alive because of her and her work. Um, so when you donate to Deep Green Resistance, you're supporting all these activists. You're paying for training programs, supporting the outreach and the platforms that we use to bring us all together, to connect us as a community. You're making it possible for us to hold events and fund campaigns you are making this work possible when you donate. You know, we all know that this economic system we live under is a big part of the problem. And yet every revolutionary movement in history finds out a way to make it possible for their core people to do the work, to focus on the work and not have to focus on working some full-time job, paying the bills, paying the rent, getting food on the table, that's what you're supporting when you donate to Deep Green Resistance. We are making progress in our fundraiser. Thank you so much to everyone who's donating. We're going to take a break now. I need to use the bathroom really bad. I'm sure some of you do as well. So we're going to take a 10-minute break 
so people can use the bathroom, uh, get a snack, make a donation if you'd like to do so, check out the auction. And when we come back, we will hear from Robert Jensen, no relation to Derek Jensen. Robert Jensen's a, a writer and an author, an activist, has been for many years, decades at this point. He's done a lot of fa fantastic work. And I will uh, do a full introduction for Bob when we return. So 10 minute break and we will come back. Thank you so much for being with us.
came up with the cat was taller than her. <laughs> like a stray cat who they probably just didn't get thrown out very easy.
Okay, everyone, we're going to get started here again. <clears throat> Folks can go ahead and take their seats or come back to your screens here. As much as I'd like to just tell everyone to walk away from your screens forever and never touch them again, we're not quite at that point yet, unfortunately. <clears throat> Okay, we are going to get started here, folks. So thank you very much. Uh, we're, we wanted to share these animal videos during our intermission. All those videos were taken by people in deep green resistance because all these topics that we're grappling with are so dire. It's, it's intense, it's intense stuff. You know, for the past 300 million years, about one species went extinct every four years on average. Now today, one species is being driven extinct every 15 minutes. And if nothing is done, one half of all species will be extinct by the end of the century. So in the face of that despair, it's so important for us to remember why we are fighting, why we are here, why we are standing in solidarity with each other and with the rest of life on this planet, right? It's because there is beauty and there is grace in this world, and that is worth holding on to and worth protecting. So thank you again to the people who are taking action, to the people who are donating to support this work. We're up to, let's see, 27% uh, of our goal. As you can see here, we're making progress. And that's something that my activist elders taught me. Uh, not everyone can be on the front lines, but everyone can still be a part of a movement like this by supporting in different ways, by donating, by helping to spread the word, networking, sharing resources, building a culture of resistance, working in solidarity. And that's what we're here to do today. So I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Robert Jensen. Robert Jensen is an emeritus professor in the School of Journalism and Media at the University of Texas, Austin, and a founding board member of the Third Coast Activist Resource Center. He collaborates with New Perennials Publishing and New Perennials Project at Middlebury College. Bob is associate professor and host of Podcast from the Prairie with Wes Jackson, and he is the author of 16 books, including an Inconvenient Apocalypse, Environmental Collapse, Climate Crisis, and the Fate of Humanity, which I've got a copy of right on my bookshelf here next to me. So welcome, Bob. It's very good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you uh, for making me part of this event. I'm very grateful. I'm speaking to you from northern New Mexico, where I lived after retiring from the University of Texas at Austin. Emeritus professor is the term. Emeritus, for those who don't know, is a Latin word that means, thank God that guy finally retired. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit today about the, the things uh, Wes Jackson and I have to say in this book, An Inconvenient Apocalypse. Before doing that, I wanna talk a bit about who Wes is because I often describe him as the most important environmental thinker most people have never heard of. Uh, Wes was on track to a normal academic career. He had a PhD in genetics. He was teaching biology, uh, went on to uh, found one of the first environmental studies programs in the country back in the early 70s, but then gave it uh, a, a change of heart an awareness of the limits of the university. And he, he co-founded an experimental school called the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. The Land Institute, still going strong, is now known mostly uh, as a uh, sustainable agriculture research center where they're working on what they call natural systems agriculture. The question of whether we might be able to grow perennial grains, not annual grains, in polycultures, not monocultures. And it's it's potentially one of the most important experiments going on in sustainable agriculture. Um, Wes is retired from running the place full time and he and I have been collaborating on a variety of projects, including books. The most recent is this book, 
an inconvenient apocalypse. And I want to start by pointing out that uh, the word apocalypse, which is commonly thought to mean the end of the world, that's how pop culture uh, uh, conveys it, is actually, um, it's a Greek word, the same as Latin revelation. It means uh, a lifting of the veil, a coming to clarity. So we use the term apocalypse not to mean the end of the world, uh, but the need for a blunt and honest assessment, a lifting of that veil. Uh, the world won't end, of course, when human beings are gone, the world will still be here. But we could also talk about the end of systems. The systems that current stru currently structure the world we live in are in fact going to end. And we have some say in whether they end violently or in some more uh, humane way. Uh, the, the, the heart of the book in some way is what we call the four hard questions. Uh, like deep green resistance, we believe that most people aren't facing up, including people in the environmental movement, not facing up to just how dire the situation is. And we convey that in these four hard questions, which I'll go through quickly. Size, scale, scope, and speed. What do we mean by size, scale, scope, and speed? And why are they hard questions? By size, we mean the question that is so uh, regularly avoided. What is the sustainable size of the human population? Uh, we've now grown, as we've been talking about, to a, a population of 8 billion. Uh, uh, think about it this way. My father was born in 1927. The world population was 2 billion when my father was born. When he died this year, the world was almost to 8 billion. That means in the lifetime of one person, you know, roughly three generations, the human population doubled and then doubled again. That's, of course, unprecedented. Uh, it's been possible because of the temporary energy and fossil fuels, but it can't go on forever. People don't like to talk about the question of a sustainable size of population for a number of reasons. One is uh, nobody really has an answer to the question of how to get to that sustainable size. Also, people who talk about population in the past have also been pretty nasty, a lot of racist, eugenicist people who saw the third world as the problem, not the first world. Uh, and so sometimes people avoid the question of population because of that association. Also, it's of course obvious that the raw number of human beings on the planet uh, means nothing without understanding how much consumption each of those people engages in. So a lot of difficult questions involved in this issue of size. Well, what about scale? Uh, here's another hard question. What is the appropriate scale of a human community? We live in nation states of 300 million, cities of many millions. Uh, human beings didn't evolve in nation states and cities, of course. And it's not surprising that we don't do so well at, at, at organizing ourselves in such large institutions. It's not how we evolved to live. And so what is the appropriate scale of a human community, of a political organization? Another hard question. What about scope? By that we mean, what is the scope of the competence of the human to manage the interventions we have already made into the larger living world? In other words, how well can we manage the technology we have created? Uh, Wes and I like to use the term technological fundamentalism to point out that probably the most dangerous fundamentalism in the world is this belief that we can manage all this high energy, high technology. What makes it especially fundamentalist is we seem to believe that we can manage even more of it to solve the problems created by previous high energy, high technology we dig the hole deeper. So we do have to deal with this question of the scope of our competence. Finally, the last question, speed. What is the speed at which we must make serious change if we are to um, guarantee a, a decent human future, perhaps any human future at all? And here the answer is painfully obvious that we have to go much faster than we are going today, and perhaps much faster than it's possible. 
So these four hard questions are routinely avoided, including, as I said, by the environmental movement, in part because there are no good or easy answers. Wes and I certainly don't pretend to have answers to these questions, but no problem that I'm aware of has ever been solved by avoiding the problem because it was hard. So we argue that these are the kinds of conversations we have to have. Um, we also, this is probably my favorite sentence in the book, and it's where I'll wrap up. In dealing with all of these, uh, the moral high ground is a dangerous place to stand, even when it's warranted. What we mean by that is, even when we believe and have reasons to believe we are taking the right positions, offering the right policy prescriptions, the moral high ground, that belief that we're right is very dangerous. It's dangerous not only because we, we understand that everybody can be wrong, people are wrong all the time, but also because um, it's, it's arrogant to believe that uh, somehow we are special. I've, the older I get, the more I think that there's not a whole lot of difference between expressions of righteousness and self-righteousness, uh, that we all should to practice a, a much deeper humility. Uh, Wes and I argue this because we're aware of what we call the temptations of dense energy. <laughs> Wes, a long time ago, was asked, well, what is the definition of life, since biologists have a hard time defining life? And he said, life is the scramble for energy-rich carbon. Like all carbon-based creatures, we, we go after that carbon. And sadly, in, in the human case, we've gotten especially good at getting it. Wes talks about the, the five pools of carbon. As Lierre said, the first pool of carbon we tapped into was agriculture, the surpluses, especially in annual grain agriculture that made so-called civilization possible. The second carbon pool were the forests, which were largely destroyed in the bronze and the iron age to produce the metals that advanced civilization. And then, of course, first coal, then oil, then natural gas, the fossil fuel carbon pools. Uh, these are tempting. Human beings tend to use all of the energy that they can get their hands on, just like other organisms. And that means that human beings face a task that no other species has had to ponder, which is how do we voluntarily limit the amount of carbon we take from the environment? Uh, other species are limited by natural forces. We have been able to temporarily um, believe we have transcended those natural forces, but of course they will come in the end back to bite us because as the phrase goes, uh, what we know for sure is that nature bats last. So uh, if that makes this book sound like a downer, uh, I haven't done a good job because it's a book that I believe has a certain amount of joy in it. As Max was saying, the beauty around us exists even in the worst of times, uh, and and we have to balance that appreciation for beauty, the joy that comes with it, with these obligations we now have to do something no other species has ever had to do, which is impose limits on ourselves collectively in ways that we don't yet know how to do. With that, uh, turn it back to Max. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, it's rare to have a voice like yours. I really appreciate your book right here. Um, it's excellent. And all of your work is so powerful. Uh, for those who don't know, Bob is also a, a very eloquent and important writer on feminist topics and brings together these issues in a way that, that few people do. So, um, Thank you again, Bob, for being with us. I hope people check out his book. Um, and I agree with the um, the point you were making, Bob, about the need for humility in the face of, of a situation like this. Um, it goes back to what Saba was saying earlier in this event about the importance of humility and speaking from the heart and being clear on what we do know and what we don't. So. I would now like to introduce our final speaker 
of this event. Derek Jensen is the co-author of Deep Green Resistance and the author of Endgame, Culture of Make-Believe, Language Older Than Words, Bright Green Lies, and many other books. It's more than 30 now. He was named one of Utney Reader's 50 Visionaries Who Are Changing Your World and won the Eric Hoffer Award in 2008. He's written articles for Orion, Audubon, and The Sun Magazine, among many others. And I'm very glad to be welcoming him to this wow. evening's event. Derek, welcome. Oh, thanks so much for running the event, Max. And thanks so much for uh, being who you are. And I say this all the time that DGR wouldn't exist without you. You are, you are, uh, it, 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 you're, you're phenomenal. Well, thanks, but um, I think it, I think you're wrong. <laughs> I think it would exist without me. And uh, there are some really great people who are behind the scenes supporting what we're doing here and who are ready to step in. You know, if something happens to me, if I end up uh, in jail at Thacker Pass or, um, you know, uh, hopefully knock on wood, nothing bad will happen to me in other ways. But um, this is this really is a collective movement with a lot of different people contributing in different ways, as we saw with all those videos. So um, you're very flattering, but <laughs> thank you. So we've got some questions for you, a few that I wrote beforehand that we discussed and a few that uh, are coming in from the audience. So if people want to submit more questions for Derek in the chat on Facebook, go ahead and do that right now. Someone, one of those wonderful volunteers, Kim is collating those questions and sending them over to me in real time. So if you have questions for Derek, write them down right now in the comments and send them over. But we'll start with this one. Um, and we're going to go back a little bit to Endgame, which came out in 2006. One of the most important books I've ever read. Can you talk about uh, yeah. three different things? What Endgame is about, how the book came about, the genesis for the book, and why after writing Endgame, you felt it was more important to be even more explicit about resistance and write the book Deep Green Resistance? So thank you. It's a great question. And Endgame really came about because I was doing talks. Well, I'm going to back up before doing talks. And when I was a baby activist, I noticed that there was a huge split in between our public and our private discourse. That privately, the grassroots activists that whom I knew were saying that they were just desperately trying to keep this or that creature alive or this or that place intact until civilization collapses. But publicly, they would be talking about the sort of imminent social shift that we were going to have to a sane and sustainable way of living. Again, privately, it's like they're all ain't gonna happen. So then I, when I started doing public talks, I would ask people in the audience, do you believe that we will undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living? And out of the thousands and thousands of people over several years who were at talks that I asked that question of, nobody ever said, yes, we're gonna have a voluntary transformation of sane and sustainable living. One person raised his hand at one talk. and said, oh, no, voluntary, of course not. Um, by which he really meant that we, will either have a transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living, or we won't be living at all by definition, because a sustainable way of living is the only way of living that will last. And so I started to ask the question, if you don't believe we're going to have a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living, and you care about life on the earth, what does this mean for your strategy and your tactics? And the answer is we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because we don't talk about it. And the reason we don't talk about it is because we're all so busy pretending that we have faith that the shift is going to hit the fan. And 
you know, every cell in my body wants for us to have a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living. But also every cell in my body knows that that's not going to happen. And, you know, we can talk about any number of examples of this. And one, one <clears throat> pretty straightforward and small example is that um, is the question of population. That the population uh, right now, more than half the children born in the world are the, the, the pregnancies are either unwanted or unplanned. And so giving women absolute reproductive freedom would would be a very good step toward solving overpopulation. And as Lierre says all the time, um, you know, the single biggest thing you can do to drop rates of first when when mother when mothers have children or when women have children and also how many children they have is teaching girls to read. So the point is that we could stop overpopulation really easily. All we would have to do is to uh, get rid of uh, patriarchal gods who you know, are um, value men's control over women. And then the other thing we would have to do is to stop capitalism's growth imperative. Um, because that's one of the reasons we know that population it concerns over population are for the most part bogus because when populations actually do start to go down as in russia uh japan denmark um what the governments do is create sex holidays for people to go home and have sex to have more babies so whatever concern is generally expressed about overpopulation is like i said for the most part bogus so the point here is is that we can't even address the problem we can't even face what the problems are directly enough to to, to resolve them and that's just on that one issue that's not even to talk about all the other issues of the technology it's like daniel quinn says that um we have part of the problem is that we are dependent for our very lives on the system that is killing the planet. And um, that's, we can talk about, if you want, we can talk about how and why that happens. But the, the short version is that the reason I wrote Endgame is because I wanted to address that question. If you don't believe there will be a voluntary transformation and you care about life on the planet, what does this mean for our strategy and for our tactics? Which is where we got to deep green resistance as well. So off that, springboarding off that, many people, you know, we talked earlier when uh, we were ending the discussion with Saba about how collapse has these positive aspects and these negative aspects, right, from, from our perspective. And it seems like much of your work especially Endgame and Deep Green Resistance, is an exploration of that, that very topic, right? Can you talk a little bit about how specifically we can accelerate the positive aspects of collapse and slow down or stop the negative aspects? Well, two things. Thank you for that also. Two things. One of them is that um, from... I think one of the most important things that people can do is they can switch their allegiance away from the industrial capitalist system or the industrial system whatsoever or civilization, because it doesn't matter whether it's capitalist or communist. I mean, both of them killed whales, both of them killed walruses, both of them mine, kill everything they touch. And so to make take our loyalty away from the system and make it to the planet that is our only home, I think that's the, the single most important shift that any of us can make. And one of the ways I think about that is what would blue whales want? What would sage grouse want? What would delta smelt want? What do coho salmon want? And that changes things really quickly because we can we can talk all we want about you know whether we want electric vehicles or not and whether we want lithium batteries 
but I can guarantee that the sage grouse don't want to mine at Thacker Pass. I, I don't have to be a sage grouse to know that. And so, I mean, I think about this and, and this, 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 this lack of loyalty, this lack of love, this lack of connection to the natural world manifests all throughout our discourse and our actions. And one of the ways I think about that is people will say, so what will it take for salmon to survive? They'll say, I really hope salmon survive. And what it will take for salmon to survive is really straightforward. They need for dams to be removed. They need for industrial logging to stop. They need for industrial fishing to stop. They need for the oceans not to be murdered. And they need for global warming to stop. And the problem is that normally when people ask, how can we help salmon survive? What they're really asking is how can we help salmon survive without taking out dams, stopping industrial logging, stopping industrial forestry, stopping the murder of the oceans and stopping global warming. And that's like saying, well, it's not like saying, it is saying, how can I stop the destructive consequences of my actions without stopping my actions? And one more thing about that is that I often think of the image of, when I think about environmentalism, I think about a body being wheeled into the emergency room and that's the body, the person's still alive and they're ble bleeding profusely. And the environmentalists, that is the doctors and nurses and everybody there is doing everything they can to stop the flow of blood, transfuse more blood in, they're putting on bandages. They're doing everything except that there still is the serial killer is standing there stabbing the body again and again. And one of the ways we need to, to deal with this is to simply stop it. And one of the ways I talk about that is if space aliens were doing to the planet what the dominant culture is doing to the planet, we would know exactly what to do. Um, but because it is the system to which under which we have uh, been born and to which we have uh, on many levels um, had our loyalty put in place, um, suddenly we get really stupid. And so far as the, the, the good things and the bad things have collapsed, the good thing, I think, again, from the perspective of prairie dogs or from the perspective of coho salmon, from the perspective of blue whales, for the most part, there aren't many downsides to collapse of industrial civilization. From the human perspective, see, when people say, you know, when civilization collapses, a lot of people are going to die. And the first thing I always respond to that is, first off, which people are you talking about? Are you talking about uh, narwhal people? Are you talking about prairie dog people? Are you talking about grizzly bear people? It's like, no, actually, we're talking about human people. And because the others don't count, which is part of the problem. And then the, the next the next thing I'll say is I'll point out that there are the largest animal migration on not in the oceans on the planet um, is not actually the Serengeti. It's not Buffalo. It's not any of the things we would expect, it's Mekong giant or Mekong giant catfish, the, the Mekong Delta giant catfish. And those populations are collapsing. They're huge catfish who migrate up and down the Mekong River. And their their populations are collapsing because of in the last 30 years because of dams. And the point here is that there are human beings, even if you don't care about Mekong catfish there are human beings who can no longer eat those catfish and have been forced into relying on the system. So when people talk about are you know, humans dying during the collapse, what they're ignoring are the humans who are being driven off their land right now. And 
they're ignoring the um Years ago, I asked Anuradha Mittal and also Vandana Shiva if the people of India would be better off if the global economy disappeared tomorrow. And they both laughed and said, yes, that people would be better off because right now there are farmers being driven off their land um, because the land is being taken for the transnational, for, for cash crops. There are former granaries of India that now export dog food and tulips to Europe. And that would be instant land reform which doesn't alter the fact that, I mean, I am reliant on high-tech medicines for my life. And I fully recognize that <clears throat> when civilization comes down, whatever that means, um, that I will be fairly early in line to die. But the truth is that the health of a planet is more important than my health anyway. And I used to, and I'll, I'll shut up in a second, but I used to, back in the mid 2000s, sometimes I would get hassled by Buddhists who would tell me, Derek, you know, you need to learn Buddhist non-attachment and you need to not be attached to the continued existence of the salmon. And that's completely backwards, that what this non-attachment should be directed to is car culture and the larger system that uh, on which we have been made dependent uh, so that, um, you know, as long as it's here, we go ahead and take advantage of it, but we aren't attached to it continuing as opposed to life on the planet, which actually Maybe I would be a terrible Buddhist because I am very attached to life continuing on this planet. Um, so I guess, I guess, oh, and one more thing I want to say is this is, you know, we all know what happens when patriarchal civic society collapses, when the mill shuts down, when, when social chaos increases. Um, one thing that happens is that men take out stress on women which is one of the reasons that I have for decades been saying that now is the time to make our loyalty to women. And now is our time to make loyalty to the natural world. And now is our time to make our loyalty with various other groups who are harmed as civic society collapses um, because because society will collapse, whether we encourage that or not. This way of living, I'm gonna sum up everything in all my work and all my however many books, I'm gonna sum it up in one sentence with a semicolon, which is um, this way of living won't last. And when it's done, I would prefer there's more of the world left rather than less. Yeah, well said. So uh, we've got questions coming in from the audience. Um, <clears throat> one of them from Kathy was about uh, whether our actions are effective or not, whether we should keep doing the same type of things that we've always done as environmentalists. It's a bit of a leading question and very much related to the quote that I sent to you in the email before this event. Do you want to read that quote or? Uh, which quote? Most of our actions are frighteningly ineffective, that one. Uh, I don't have that one up. Why don't you read it? Okay, well, the quote is, most of our actions are frighteningly ineffective, yet we keep on doing the same old symbolic actions and keep on calling the making of this or that statement a great victory. Many activists get burned out and frustrated because they're trying to achieve sustainability within a system that is inherently unsustainable. What would happen if we listened to such feelings of despair? Could they tell us that what we're doing isn't working and so we should try something else? Do you want to respond to that at all? I've got other questions coming in as well so we can jump yeah, in. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a great and important question. And I, I think a, a couple things. One is that... I have a good friend, John Osborne, who is a medical doctor, and he always says the correct diagnosis is the first step toward proper treatment. 
And if we misdiagnose the problem, for example, if we believe that the biodiversity crash is primarily caused by the fuel that is used to uh, run the economy as opposed to the effects of the economy itself, then our solutions will not be uh, adequate to the problem. And I think, I mean, on one hand, yes, we do need to do things differently. And on the other hand, I also just want to say that I don't want to put any disrespect onto anybody who is filing timber sale appeals or who is uh, using the legal system to attempt to stop mines. Um, I don't, the, the big distinction, and this is a, a line I've stolen from Lear Keith, the big distinction is not between those who want to bring down civilization and those who don't. The big distinction between those who do something and those who do nothing. So I am a huge believer in once you've made your loyalty to, to wild nature or to a specific place or a specific species, then, then your actions become simply technical and you figure out what is the best way. And there are, you know, I... I know someone in New York City whose contributions to wild nature consist of going to Central Park and feeding raccoons and pigeons. And, and I have great respect for that in that space. And then someone else, uh, basically where this comes to is, you know, if I think one of the most important things to do is to preserve every wild place possible such that um, it's like John Osborne also says that if bull trout are still here in 10 years, they may be here in a hundred, but if bull trout are gone in 10, they may be, they'll, they'll be gone forever. And so I think one of the things that we need to ask ourselves is what do these various species or places need? And then ask, how do we get there to give them what they need? So yes, what we're doing, I mean, obviously what we're doing isn't working because every biological indicator is going the wrong direction. So obviously what we're doing is not working. Does that mean that we should stop everything we're doing? No, because I don't believe in the great reform versus revolution dichotomy, because if we all wait for the great glorious revolution for the perfect action, the world will get ground down to nothing in the meantime. And if all we do is to continue to follow the same tactics that we've been using forever, then the world will also continue to get ground down. So, you know, one of the things that I, I like, I often talk about the German resistance and, the, and various resistance to the Nazis in World War II. I talk about the German resistance, French resistance, Polish resistance, um, Czech resistance, you know, all, all sorts of countries, all sorts of peoples. And a big difference between then and now is that the, uh, the members of the resistance didn't have to take on the Germans all by themselves in that there were the, you know, there was the, the Soviet army and the American Air Force and the British Air Force, American Army, et cetera. And so they just had to do sort of adjunct work or associated work. And the thing is, I think we actually are in a similar situation because life wants to live and nature is doing most of the work, most of the work of keeping everyone alive and also most of the work of harming civilization, you know, a a, what are termites doing? Termites, what are, what are pests doing? What pests are doing is attempting to destroy monocrops. They're attempting to help return it to a, to a native state. So all we have to do is align ourselves in whatever way possible with wild nature and, 
And then, like I said, everything else becomes technical. So this is a bit of a <clears throat> follow-up question, excuse me. And this one comes from um, our friend Valentina, or excuse me, not Valentina, Paula. Um, I was thinking of her daughter <laughs> because I was going to say, um, Paula is a mother of two. And I think that that plays into the context of her question. Um, Paula asks, in our culture, especially in developed countries, we live in extreme comfort. What do you suggest people do to prepare for imminent collapse? How do we push ourselves to be better prepared for what is to come? I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about another story that you often tell about the resistance in Warsaw and uh, the rates of survival. Oh yeah, the 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 rate of survival of those who fought back were higher than those who went along, and in the in the Warsaw ghetto. And the, I think the, the whole the whole question of what we can do to prepare, I think is a is a kind of interesting one because, on one hand, I am mainly, uh, I'm not so interested in my own personal survival as I am, the survival of the land, and what I want to do is to. Uh, attempt to um, attempt to 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 shift discourse as much as possible through my work and to um, help protect as much wild nature as possible through my work. And then so far as my own personal survival, it's a little bit funny that I actually do have a year's worth of food, but that came not because of my peak oil friends, uh, you know, telling me I need to, to be, to prepare. Instead, uh, my mom got this year's supply of food because uh, two of my siblings and their families are Mormon. And, uh, you know, Mormons are really big on prepping. And so, it's really funny that I, you know, I actually do have a year's worth of food, but it's it's from an entirely different direction, um, and and also I think another thing that, you know, one of the reasons that I raised chickens when I lived in Spokane is because I wanted to make the mistakes when I could still go to Albertsons for groceries. So I think that's another thing. People really are interested in in their own prepping. Now is the time to learn how to garden because you're going to mess it up for the first four years. I mean, maybe you're smarter than I am, but I mess everything up for the first, you know, half dozen times I try it. And uh, it's better to be able to do that when you have a safety net. Um, so that's that's in terms of personal preparation. There's there's, you know, learn all of those skills now. Says the guy who would have trouble tying my shoes without instructions. So we've got a bunch more great questions coming in. Um, some pretty fascinating ones here. So uh, this is a bit related to Bright Green Lies, Derek. From Tony. Tony asks, as a society, how do we get out of this mess? Damned if we don't shift to non-fossil fuel energy and damned if we do by triggering more overgrowth. That's an honest question that many environmentalists are asking. What do you think? Well, it's really difficult because, I mean, if, if I were in charge of the economy, um, I would on day one, I mean, there, I would not deindustrialize in one day. I would on day one, get rid of uh, golf courses and uh, retractable stadium roofs, even though I like sports. Day two, I would start getting rid of lawns. You know, there, there is so much that could be done within the context of this system that would be more reasonable. I, I mention this all, all the time, that the world's commercial fishing fleets are subsidized to a value greater than the catch. So I would just change those subsidies if I was in charge. And that's the easy stuff. And then the harder stuff, the cuts that would be more painful would, would, in my mind, come later. 
But again, this is all predicated on the system being reasonable and not having a death urge, not having an urge to destroy all life on the planet, not having the sadism that, that Lear talked about earlier, the necrophilia that, you know, Lear talks about and that Eric Fromm has talked about and, and um, Lewis Mumford talked about. And so part of, part, of, part of what is central to my own work is the notion that the problems we face are not fundamentally rational and therefore they're not solvable by purely rational means. There is this, in, in some ways, we simply have to stop the destroyers. And I've, I've sort of wandered away from the question. Oh, so the question is, and part of the problem too with, with, with the notion of transferring over to, to so-called renewables is Jevons' paradox, which, which the short version is just that every new type of energy that comes online adds to rather than replaces the old types. So the addition of solar, wind, et cetera, doesn't actually reduce oil or coal use in significant fashions. It simply adds on. And so that whole thing is a real shell game anyway. That's not, I always come back to, does this help the Delta smelt? Does this help mangrove swamps? And there are things we can do. Um, we can restore prairies, we can restore forests. And you know, you know what the best thing you can do to restore a forest is? Nothing. Just let it come back. Forests know how to grow. And for the most part, they don't really need our help. They don't need to be thinned. They don't need to have the dog hair cut out. They will get rid of their own dog hair. They will, they they have been doing we're never supposed to verbalize nouns, but they have been foresting for a long time. And uh, Max, I'm going to turn it over to you for just a second so you can tell us about the extremely difficult process involved in restoring a peat bog. Yeah, well, a lot of peat bogs in the northern regions of the world, Scandinavia um, among them, Scotland as well, elsewhere, have been... Uh, diked and and drained in order to mine the peat out for power plants and also for potted plants and uh, peat is an in incredibly dense form of carbon the moss just grows higher and higher and the layer gets thicker and thicker and at the bottom it just compresses very dense so it's almost like coal when you dig down into these peat bogs um <clears throat> very high carbon emissions when you burn it as an energy source. And the process of restoring a peat bog is the, the uh, ditches that were dug to drain them, you fill those ditches in. And then? That's it. <laughs> Sounds hard. Yeah. The thing is, is this is what's true for, for most of these things. There are more than 400 dead zones in the ocean, and there's one that's recovered. And the one that recovered is in the Black Sea off the coast of the former Soviet Union. Um, and uh, it recovered because when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was no longer economically viable to uh, do industrial agriculture in that region. And so it uh, they stopped putting on industrial fertilizers and pesticides. And within 20 years, the dead zone had recovered enough. They have a local commercial fishery. Yeah. And that's the, I want to be clear. I am in no way saying, oh, the earth will be okay. I really don't like it when people say that because it shows a complete lack of care for, for wild nature. What we know though, is that bodies have tremendous recuperative power. And uh, Max, in your life, have you ever gotten a cut anywhere? One or two. And the body recovered. You didn't even have to do anything. The body just heals. But the problem is that if you had your jugular cut and you bled out, you would no longer be able to heal. If, 
if the wounds are too severe. They used to think a long time ago that one unit of harm, or sorry, one unit of injury caused one unit of harm. So if you put in one unit of pollution, it causes one unit of harm in the lake. And if you do 10 units, it's 10 units of harm. If you, the same, you can cut one tree and it cause, does a little bit of harm. You cut 50 trees, it does a certain amount of harm. But that's not true at all, how, how it ends up working. The way it really ends up working is that they, that these natural communities, what people call ecosystems, very much want to try to continue in their own way. And so you can cause a certain amount of harm and the, the place can recover. More harm and it can recover, more harm and it can recover. And then there's a certain point at which it can't recover. Just like a body, you know, if you, <laughs> if you get beaten up to a certain point, you can recover. But if you get beaten up past that point, you're dead. And once you're dead, there's no coming back. And the, uh, this applies to, um, you know, all sorts of, of, of wild nature. And there are places that have been pushed over edges and that won't come back. And, but what we do know is that if we don't stop the primary harm, if we don't stop this culture from, I mean, th this culture will, given the opportunity, it will kill everything there is. And, you know, years ago, decades ago now, <clears throat> um, I was talking with someone about how uh, the, uh, how, do, how were the Germans so stupid as to maintain such meticulous records of their atrocities? And he looked at me and said, Derek, what do you think GDP is? That's all it is. It's a meticulous record of the conversion of the living to the dead and how quickly it's being done. Um, wow. So we've got some more questions I want to get to, but just a reminder for folks who are watching, uh, this is Derek Jensen, co-author of Deep Green Resistance, who we're hearing from right now. Uh, this event is a fundraiser for our organization, Deep Green Resistance. If you're watching on Facebook, check out the link in the comments to the fundraising page on GiveButter, where you can donate to support our work, support activists all around the world. Um, <clears throat> we've got time for a few more questions, Derek. Um, Great. Uh, one story that I just wanted to share, I was just literally earlier today reading an article, a peer-reviewed scientific article from Malaysia that was looking at the relationship between logging and fish populations in those, those areas that were being logged. And the scientists expected a, a linear relationship where if you clear cut and take all the trees, it's really going to be bad for the fish. And if you do nothing and it's a very intact forest, the fish will be healthy. And if you take some trees in the middle, it'll be in between, right? They expected a a linear relationship. What they found was basically as soon as you start cutting any significant number of trees, the fish population drops. So it's a very non-linear response to um, to the industrial logging in that type of situation. What do people expect? I mean, if you destroy their habitat, you kill them. You you destroy their capacity to live. I, I don't understand what. <clears throat> see, that's one of the things that has frustrated me my entire adult life is that none of the stuff I write about is particularly cognitively challenging. I mean, if your way of life is based on the use of non-renewable resources, it won't last. Duh. If your way of life is based on the hyper-exploitation of renewable resources, it won't last. If you perceive non-humans as resources, you will treat them as resources and you will use them up. And that way of living won't last. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how any of this is, is hard. You know, if there are uncountable salmon and then you can count them and there's 6 million and then you can count them and there's 2 million, then you can count them and there's a half million, then you can count them and there's a quarter million. I don't know, is this a, is this a difficult pattern to, to see? Or here's another one. You know, they say one sign of sentience is the ability to recognize patterns. I'm gonna lay out a pattern. Let's see if we can recognize it in less than 6,000 years, which is the first written myth of West, or when people think of Iraq, is the first thing they think of cedar forests so thick that sunlight never touches the ground. The first written myth of Western civilization is Gilgamesh deforesting 
Iraq to make a great city. The Arabian Peninsula was Oak Savannah. Uh, the Near East was heavily forested. We've all heard of the Cedars of Lebanon. They still have one on their flag. Um, Italy was heavily forced and Greece was heavily forced. One of those ancient dead Greek gods, I don't remember which one, I think it was Plato, was complaining that deforestation was harming water quality. And I have absolutely no doubt that the Greek Department of Environmental Quality said, oh, we need to study this for a few years and make sure that there's really a correlation. North Africa was heavily forested. Those were, were cut down to make the Egyptian and Phoenician navies. And I don't understand. I mean, this pattern is not if you put dams in, how are you surprised that that kills an adrenous fish? I don't understand. I don't understand how anybody could be surprised. Yeah. I don't understand how anybody could be surprised that if you, you know, I became an environmentalist when I was in second grade because um, they put in a subdivision near where I live. And I remember thinking, where will the meadow larks go and where will the garter snakes go and where will the cottonwood trees go and the grasshoppers and everybody else and so i understood that and i had that language when i was seven the language i didn't have but i understood still the concept which you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet i don't understand why this is so hard absolutely it's not and it's not but when you build an entire ideology, an entire culture around the idea that growth is the highest good, uh, that ideology becomes self-sustaining, no matter how insane it is, right? And, and, you know, as I am not the first to point out that that's the logic of cancer. Right. <laughs> so we've got some great questions coming in. Okay. Um, I'll try right. to answer fast. Raisa asked a question about, do you believe there are ethical forms of accelerationism and what might that look like? You know, I think the task before us really is not dissimilar. I and mean, we need to protect, you know, we need to act defensively and to protect uh, wild places and wild beings. We need to do that. We need to, um, you know, it's no matter as, as again, as Lierre says, no matter what you love, it's under assault. And so, I mean, long form thinking is under assault, which is one reason I write books, because I, I believe that politics by sloganeering is terrible. Hmm. And um, that's my slogan. And, um, and I know this woman, Charlotte Watson, who works to defend her life's work is protecting women from men's violence and stopping men's violence against women. And that's fine. You know, that's the great thing about everything being messed up is no matter where you look, there's great work to be done. So she can do that. Somebody else can work on salmon. Somebody else can work on lampreys. Somebody else can work on, we need to mention Yushalon smelt because nobody ever talks about them. Yeah. And they're just as important as the lampreys and the salmon. But anyway, um, and they need a defender. You know, they need they need people to step up and and defend them. And what was the question again? Ethical forms of acceleration. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I think on one hand, we do need to defend places at the same time. I think we need to think about this kind of like when they demolish a building in a city. The demolition experts want to make it collapse in place so it takes down as little of the surroundings as possible. And if we recognize that the system is going to collapse at some point, I would prefer that we try to take it down, causing as little harm as possible. We make it a controlled demolition. Because here's the thing, we know that if we do nothing, it is going to be really nasty. And it's gonna be really nasty for humans, non-humans, I don't care who. It's gonna be nasty anyway, but there are ways it will be the longer we wait the nastier it is if somebody would have brought down civilization 200 years ago people in kentucky could still eat passenger pigeons you know part of the reason i became an environmentalist too is from a fundamental conservatism by which i don't mean socially conservative i just mean i think it's really stupid to exterminate a species that you might need to eat tomorrow i just think that's remarkably it is the stupidest possible thing one could do. 
And if somebody would have brought down civilization, whatever that means, 150 years ago, people in this area could still eat salmon. And I just think it's, so it's absurd sometimes when people call me a misanthrope. It's like, I'm the one who doesn't want to have hell on earth in the next yeah. 50, 100 years. I'm thinking yeah. of our allies in the Philippines, the video that we watched earlier fighting to defend that community from the pumped hydro power uh, storage dam that would deprive the community of their fresh water, their drinking water, and provide them with electricity to, to what? Power Xboxes and shopping well, malls? Well, this, this is, there's a very important line written in an essay by George Mombio 10, 11 years ago about, he said, one of the problems with wind and solar, he said, is how are we going to get the energy that we need to run our brick factories? And I want to change a couple words in that and see how it sounds. How are the capitalists going to get the energy that they need to run their brick factories? Hmm. We need to disidentify with the system and identify with the land. And then this whole accelerationism becomes, again, a matter of tactics and a matter of figuring out what targets are strategic, tactical, and moral. And I mean, I think there are no circumstances I can think of in the world where it would be acceptable to blow up a hospital. You know, I don't care if this is World War II blowing up a field hospital. I mean, it doesn't matter. That that's 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 immoral. So I want to take that off the table right away. Um, there are, and then there become the questions of, you know, when is it? So many years ago, when I was writing Endgame, I used to talk about the importance of removing dams and. Um, I thought, and this one guy got really mad at me at a couple of talks and said, that's terrible for you to say that people should take out dams because it actually harms rivers when you, when you take out dams. And, um, so I started calling up from some fisheries biologists and said, Hey, uh, if somebody blows up a dam, will that hurt the river? And they would hang up on me. Um, and so then I, I got smart and I called back and I said, Okay, here's what I'm really asking is let's pretend that the electrical grid has gone down and the dam is no longer useful and you can remove the dam without harming any human beings. Is it, would it be beneficial to various rivers to take out dams or to simply let the dams eventually collapse on their own? And they were all universal. As soon as I made it so I wasn't being a terrorist, they, they said, oh, you need to take them out right now. Take them out now, now, now. And they all said, but basically a dam collapsing. First off, dams happen in rivers. Um, it's just the problem is that there's dams everywhere. Dams, log jams, mudslides, lava flows, those happen. And, and then they eventually go through and fish survive it. For example, you know, there was the Missoula flood some 10,000 years, 12,000 years ago was like all of the like six times as much water as all the rest of the rivers in the world combined was flowing down the Columbia. I don't remember if it was 200 feet deep, 60 miles an hour, or 60 feet deep, 200 miles an hour. It was one of those two, I think. And it carried house-sized boulders all the way down to Portland and then sent them up the Willamette Valley. That's how big it was. And salmon survived it and sturgeon survived it, but they're not surviving the dams. And so anyway, people are telling me this. And I call this one person who works on a river up in the Olympic National Park, and she loves this river. And she said, we misdefine rivers completely. And this is gonna have a point. We misdefine rivers completely, that we think about a river as just flowing through a channel. But the truth is that rivers ride like snakes across the landscape. They're here, then they move over here, then they move back over here, and they, they dance, they sway. And she said, every time the river that she loves floods, it breaks her heart because it kills deer, it kills frogs, it kills fish, it kills trees. But every time the river floods, it fills her with joy because this is making new habitat. And she said, every time there's a flood, it's short-term habitat loss and long-term habitat gain. And when she said that to me, I 
it was a slap in the face. And I realized, why do we stay in bad relationships? Why do we stay in jobs we don't like? Why do we not bring down civilization? It's because of the fear of short-term habitat for the, it's fear of the short-term habitat loss for the long-term habitat gain. And so I think that if we think about If we ask ourselves, what does the forest need? What does the Mississippi River need? What does the, what do the Yushalan smelt need? When we think about those, then we can ask, does this action help them? Is it tactical? Is it strategic? How does it match with our larger goals? And is it, and is it moral? And then, um, if so, then we can think about proceeding. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. That's well said. So um, I think we're going to try and wrap up here. Um, we got some more great questions that we're not going to get to. Um, Evan asked a wonderful question about human supremacism and how do we reach thousands of well-meaning people in the environmental movement who um, have sort of bought into a human-centric human supremacist approach just kind of by default because that's the norm in the environmental movement, broadly speaking. Um, I think that's a fantastic question. Go ahead, Derek. I'm just going to say very quickly, I think what we do is we continue to, to put our, I don't know if you can hear the dog snoring. Anyway, um, we continue. <laughs> Nice. Um, anyway, we, we we continue to express biocentric views, and we give them permission to express biocentric views, and we simply unabashedly express biocentric views, and um, and let them. That will, in time, give them permission to be able to do it themselves. I think that's one of the best ways to do it. Um, and I also think also about the line from some thriller novel I read, the first one through the door always gets shot. And that's true with, with discourse, too. The first one through the door gets laughed at. The tree who? What are you talking about? But after enough people have started to say the tree who, then it gives other permission, other people permission to do it as well. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Some all other great questions of uh, Thomas, Joe, um, Kathy, we see your questions. Sorry, we don't have time to get to them all. Some of them I hope have been answered to some extent in the course of this discussion and the course of this event. Um, Derek, do you wanna close out with uh, the piece that I asked you to read earlier and then we can wrap up the event? Uh, which one, the picket pin and the picket pin, or the other one, or both? Uh, why don't you choose? Which one are you uh, called to? I have the picket pin and stake right in front of me, so I'll do that one. Do it. Um, this is from the end of near the end of Endgame. Um, I want to describe a tradition of the Cheyenne dog soldiers, and that's called the picket pin and stake. And before a battle, a few of the bravest Cheyenne dog soldiers would be chosen to wear sashes of tan skins called dog ropes. Attached to each dog rope was a picket pin, normally used to tether horses. During battle, the pin would be driven into the ground as a mark of resolve. Once the pin was driven, the dog soldier would remain staked to that piece of ground even to his death. Retreat was no longer an option. The pin could only be removed when everyone was again safe or when another dog soldier relieved him of his duty. It is time. I've driven my picket pin. I'm staked out and willing to give no more. Sorry, the reason I'm laughing is because the dog is snoring so loud. Anyway, it is time. I've driven my picket pin. I'm staked out and willing to give in no more. Why will you drive your own picket stake? Where will you choose to make your stand? Give me a threshold, a specific point at which you'll finally stop running, at which you'll finally fight back. Stand with me. Stand and fight. I am one and with a snoring dog by me. Anyway, I'll start that over. Stand with me. Stand and fight. I am one. We would be two. 
two more might join and we would be four. When four more join, we would be eight. I will be eight people fighting, whom others will join. And then more people and more stand and fight. The questions before each of us now are, what are your gifts and how can you use them in the service of your land base? What can you do? What does your land base most need from you? How can you achieve it? What do you want to do? And right now, mm. perhaps the most important of all, mm. what are you willing to do? Mm. Mm. Thank you so much, Derek. Um, 13 years ago, it was seeing Derek speak, seeing him give his endgame talk that really changed the course of my life. So if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend doing so. It's on YouTube. We all know how bad things are. And yet despair is only for those who see the end beyond all doubt. We do not. Our words matter. Our actions matter. There are many things that are outside our control, but as long as you love one tree, one wild meadow, one untamed creature, whether it's a wolf or a buffalo or a single beetle, as long as there is one blade of grass left alive, as Lear often says, it's our duty to stand in solidarity with this cycle of life, our honor to align ourselves with this. So I want to say thank you again to all of our wonderful speakers, to everyone who is donating. We've raised, let's see, we've raised about $7,000 so far. It's only a small fraction of our goal. We really appreciate it, but we're aiming to raise $6,000 for the action in the Philippines alone, much more for our other projects. So please continue to donate if you can. Give monthly if you can. Contact us if you want to donate or support in a different way. This fundraiser will remain open. So if you can't donate right now, if you need to wait for payday or whatever, uh, this link will still work, the Give Butter link. The auction will remain open for a few more days as well. So take a look at those items. You know, the mainstream environmental movement gets foundation funding from these foundations that really don't support fundamental or revolutionary change. So we rely on people to support our work, average people. We're always available here at Deep Green Resistance to talk with you, answer questions, to work with you. So please reach out to us uh, if you want to get involved. <laughs> There's Jamie. Or if you want to discuss these issues with us. Sign up for our email list, sign up for the DGR news service, the Green Flame podcast, follow us on social media, and most importantly, make your allegiance to the natural world. Thank you all very much.